have the pleasure of uh, welcoming Professor Jun Hao Chu uh, to be with us virtually from the University of Washington. And uh, Jun Hao obtained his uh, Bachelor of Science degree from the National Jiao Tong University in Taiwan in 2004, his PhD degree from Stanford in 2012, and uh, where he obtained many very beautiful high impact work uh, on the subjects of iron based superconductors and topological materials. And then he did his postdoc work at both UC Berkeley and uh, Stanford, working on iridates and other quantum materials before joining the University of Washington as an assistant professor in 2016. Zhu Hao has since then won numerous, numerous awards, uh, which include the Young Investigator Award from the Air Force, the Moore Fellowship in Material Synthesis, the Sloan Fellowship, the Pecker Fellowship, and the Presidential Early Career Award last year. So basically, everything you can possibly get as an assistant professor. Zhu uh, Hao is also a pioneer in studying the metacity in a variety of quantum materials, and uh, he is one of the very first uh, people to develop experimental techniques for tuning the metacity uh, from uh, the beginning mechanical clamp type devices to situ tunable piezo stack devices, where he can he's shown beautiful work on how to extract uh, quantities uh, related to pneumatic sensibility. And that is the subject at which uh, he will tell us about today and in his talk of uh, pneumatic quantum criticality. In iron based superconductors. So, uh, so I guess Jun Hao, you can if you, uh, take it. Uh, we can, yeah, carry <laughs> from Jun Hao. And if you have questions, you can, I guess, uh, type in the chat if you want to, which I will try to keep track of. So. All right, sure. Uh, thank you very much, Ming, for the very generous and kind introduction. And uh, yeah, it's a great pleasure to, to you know, give you this talk virtually, and especially in front of the world leaders in, in this field. So, um, so what I'm what I'm going to talk uh, talk about today is a story about um, two remarkable findings uh, near the pneumatic quantum critical points of the iron-based superconductors. So the first one is that we find out that the superconductivity near this pneumatic quantum critical point is extremely sensitive to strength. It's so sensitive so that, uh, for example, for this underdog compound with 13 or 11 Kelvin TC, you can fully suppress the superconductivity. You know, the TC can extrapolate to zero with um, within one percent of strength. And obviously, this in, you know, this has something to do with pneumatic quantum criticality, but it also implies that there's a very strong electron uh, lattice coupling in this material. So, in order to further investigate that, we develop a um, new experimental technique, which I temporarily call this uh, elasto XRD, you know, elasto X-ray diffraction. So this is basically a combination of in situ strength tuning with the X-ray diffractions, so that we can, you know, using X-ray to, 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 to extract all the structural microscopic information, such as lattice constant, twin populations of the crystal while we're strength tuning and then doing the resistive measurements. So from this kind of uh, uh, measurements, we can very precisely detune the crystals and then extract a, um, a quantity that, that was not um, being able to, I mean, no, kind of uh, measured before, but now we, we can measure it with a much higher weight of precisions. And this quantity, uh, which uh, we, we call it a spontaneous lasso residual coefficient, it's basically the spontaneous resilient isotropy divided by the spontaneous lattice distortions within the pneumatic phase. And um, we believe that this quantity is a way to measure the electron lattice coupling of the materials you know, in, uh, in the pneumatic states and then what we find out is that this quantity actually increased significantly as we approach a pneumatic quantum critical point. It's basically increased by almost fourfold. And um, so th this is basically telling us that even though you know, when you're suppressing the pneumaticity in these materials, the electron are becoming more and more sensitive to lattice uh, and then possibly to do with this um, uh, high temperature superconductivity in this material. Okay, so before I uh, begin the, the full talk, let me acknowledge the people who actually do this work. So these works are really driven by my students, uh, Joshua Shua Sanchez and then Paul Manilowski. So Paul had did all, all the, most of the works on, on the uh, suppression of superconductivity and then Shua um, is really the, the, the driving force of, uh, of this development of elasto X-ray diffraction. And for the elasto X-ray diffraction, we're also working closely with the Phil Wright and John Woo Kim, you know, um, staff scientists in the uh, APS of Argonne National Lab as well as Jen Liu from the University of Tennessee. Okay, so this is the outline of my talk. I'm going to give an a, a overview or background on the pneumaticity and superconductivity in iron-based superconductor. And then I'm, a, I'm going to turn into the extreme sensitivity of superconductivity to strength, and then finally, this new transport coefficient. So starting from the first. 
So let me begin with the uh, phase diagram of, um, of the two kind of uh, high TC superconductors we have so far. So on the left is the uh, phase diagram of the iron nickel, no, iron based superconductor, the prototypical um, iron based superconductor, cobalt of iron, barium, iron to arsenic two. And the right hand side one is the YBCO, the cuprate. So at first glance, this temperature and then doping phase diagram looks rather similar for this two high temperature superconductor. You have a uh, magnetic symmetry breaking phase at the zero doping and then as you tune the doping and uh, suppress this magnetic symmetry breaking phase and then superconductivity emerge. And this magnetic symmetry breaking phase is an anti ferron magnets. Now, this certainly motivates the consideration of spin fluctuation as appearing for the um, superconductivity in both class of materials. But if you take a further look, then uh, you can start to see the difference. Uh, for example, in the iron-based superconductor, the anti magnetic phase actually forming a collinear anti ferromagnetic magnetic order that breaks the crystal uh, C4 symmetry. The iron spins are aligned ferromagnetic along one direction and then aligned anti magnetically along the other directions. And this nesting wave vector um, is, this, this ordering wave vector you know, um, has a you know, special um, uh, uh, implications um, when you're considering the Fermi surface of these materials. So this is another difference between the iron-based superconductor and the cuprate, where the iron-based superconductor is a multi-band materials where the cuprate can be uh, quite well described by a single band upper model. Now for the iron-based superconductor, you have at least two whole pockets in the zone centers and then two electron pockets at the zone corner. And this ordering wave vector naturally nests this, um, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the electron and hole pockets. So um, again, no, this, this kind of nesting wave vector uh, motivates you know, the consideration of spin fluctuation creating this S plus minus uh, superconducting states. So um, this seems to be the end of the story, but uh, if you uh, look further closely into the phase diagram, then you realize that there's actually another phase appearing on top of the anti ferromagnetic phase. This is this green region here where there seems to be a phase transition separated from the magnetic phase. And this phase is the so-called pneumatic phase, which um, in some sense, you can think of it as a melting of the spin density wave or melting of the uh, magne magnetic stripes, where the system can break this uh, symmetry uh, sequentially. So first, you can break the uh, C4 symmetry um, and lowering the symmetry to C2 by developing a spin fluctuation and isotropy. You know, for example, at the tetragonal paramagnetic phase, you have spin fluctuation um, both along the x direction and y direction, but once you enter pneumatic states, you know, the fluctuation is stronger along one direction than the other. Then once you develop this pneumatic phase, when you further cool the system, then finally the system breaks the translation norm and, um, and uh, uh, time reversal symmetry. So this pneumatic phase is actually the so-called Q equals zero symmetry breaking phase. Uh, namely, in that phase, no, there is no translation of symmetry breaking. Uh, the, the, the old parameter is, um, no, is, is basically a physical quantity that is uniform across the space. Now, this kind of uh, rotational symmetry break, breaking phase uh, um, is uh, by symmetry. It will be linearly coupled to the lattice. You know, uh, some of the uh, lattice torsion um, uh, that lowering the, the crystal point group symmetry. So in the tetragonal case, then this uh, is corresponding to a orthorhombic distortion. And then indeed, when you do the measurements, X-ray diffraction measurement, measuring the crystal lattice uh, below the pneumatic phase transition, you can see the orthorhombicity, which is defined by the A lattice constant minus B lattice constant divided by A plus B. That develops uh, below the phase transition, you now following like a mean field behavior. And what is really um, interesting in this, uh, um, pioneering work by the uh, Iowa State uh, group is that they find out that this structural transitions, actually uh, the lattice distortion is being suppressed once the system enter into the, the superconductivity phase. So this really implies that the superconductivity is actually competing with the orbicity and then with the structural distortion. And then this structural distortion is really just a secondary order parameter that, um, that follow the primary electronic order parameter. Uh, uh, which is really the driving force of the phase transition. Um, so this linear coupling between the electron uh, uh, pneumaticity and then the orthorhombic distortion also allow us to do another kind of measurements, which is called the elastic residue measurements. And these measurements turn out to be a, a very uh, powerful way to probe the pneumatic fluctuation or probe the pneumatic accessibility of the system. And the idea is follow. Now, if we treat you know, the receive and isotropy as a proxy of the pneumatic order parameter, 
since they transform the same way. So in the in the um, in this uh, tetragonal point point group, you now at least you, know, you expect that they will be linearly proportional to each other in the infinitesimal level. Then uh, when you're measuring the um, induced residual anisotropy by applying a controllable anisotropic strength above the phase transition, then you're effectively measuring the pneumatic susceptibility. Now, this is the same way like you're measuring the magnetic susceptibility of a ferromagnets magnets where you're applying a field and measuring the induced magnetization. Here, you're measuring the pneumatic susceptibility by measuring the induced residual anisotropy by an isotropic strength. So in practice, you're gluing a crystal on the sidewall of a piezo stack, which will, um, um, for example, like elongate it along this direction and then contract along uh, this um, uh, along along this direction if you're applying a positive voltage along the polling direction. And by putting the contact on the like, um, corners of the crystal, you can very precisely extract the residual and isotropy, you know, decompose them, the residual tensor, and then uh, find out that residual and isotropy is indeed linearly responding to the anisotropic strength. And then by fitting a slope then you can get this quantity of elastic coefficient, which is proportional to pneumatic susceptibility, and then showing a divergent behavior as you're approaching the phase transition. Now, uh, one thing I want to point out, and then which will be useful uh, later, is that um, if you look um, closer, then you'll find out that this elastic coefficient, although having a divergent one over T temperature dependence, but it actually doesn't reach a, a, a you know, infinite value as you actually sitting on a phase transition. So this is unlike the ferromagnet, magnet, which you, you do believe that your uh, this magnetic susceptibility will diverge at a critical temperature. Here, the reason is because um, uh, the quantity we're measuring is not the the, the 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 true susceptibility of the whole system. This is actually measuring the beer susceptibility. The uh, this is a susceptibility as if the system uh, is um, uh, sitting on a fi fixed rigid lattice. You know, you, you kind of turn up the electron lattice coupling and then see how this. Uh, uh, electronic system diverge. And then once you turn on this electron lattice coupling, then the actual phase transition temperature will, will, will actually enhance from the divergent temperature of this beer susceptibility. And then this is just because that this lattice is acting like a polarizable medium. Therefore, you don't need to actually fully diverge your, your, your susceptibility in order to, to reach a phase transition um, instability. So, so this is no. This is just uh, an, an an important fact about this uh, elastic coefficient, which will be quite quite helpful when we are uh, discussing this uh, spontaneous elastic coefficient in later part of this talk. So, uh, in any case, no, we we find out that this pneumatic susceptibility diverge, and this is kind of also another um, evidence of the system is driven by uh, electron emitticity. The structural transition is driven by electronic emitticity, and then you, you can measure that uh, across a wide range of doping of these materials. And um, and you know if you plot this and elastic coefficient in a color map, then um, what you can see is that this um, uh, elastic coefficient has a strongest intensity uh, near the optimal doping. And then in fact, if you plot the superconducting PC. Uh, versus the maximum value of the elastic coefficient of the range of iron-based superconductor, including the phosphorus dope, the nickel doped, the iron chalcogenides, and then a few cobalt doping, um, which is these uh, black uh, dots that you'll find out that there's a nice uh, linear correlations between the maximum of the pneumatic susceptibility and the uh, TC of the material. This certainly kind of implies that um, uh, the pneumatic susceptibility or the pneumatic fluctuation could also be beneficial or even responsible for the pairing interaction in this material. So this this kind of idea is not uh, only driven by experimental um, uh, observation, but there's also a few theoretical works uh, kind of pushing forward this idea of um, pneumatic quantum critical fluctuation could help to boost the superconductivity in uh, every pairing channel. Obviously, the question is, um, can we directly test this idea? Is there a way that we can uh, control the fluctuations and then and then um, and then see, you know, for example, like PC changes if let's say we turn off the fluctuation? And uh, to to put it in, into a broader context, you know, if you look at the phase diagram of Joe, jo Joe, how can, yes, can I ahead. stop you? If do you mind? Sure. Uh, so, so this issue of T star being different from TS. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I agree with what you uh, uh, said and you analyzed before, mm -hmm. but I, I wonder just, uh, uh, and also it sort of brings the T stars sort of closer to T nail, which is interesting. Mm 
uh, compared to TS uh, mm -hmm. to T nail curves, uh, uh, at least on this plot. But uh, in principle, there's a second way, which is that uh, the transition could be first order, in which case uh, this uh, T star parameter that you get from, I guess, some kind of curly wise type of fit, right? Mm -hmm. uh, of the pneumatic susceptibility would mm -hmm. also be different from TS. So I, I just wonder uh, how much, uh, I, I think in some of these materials, at least there's some statement that the structural phase transition is first order. Uh, I, I just wonder how much um, affects, maybe just the details, but uh, is there some- My uh, understanding that, that's is coming that, to play? Uh, the structural transition is first order. I think, um, uh, at least my understanding is that um, even for the parent compound, the structural transition is second order. However, the anti Fehrman transition um, is first order within this um, doping range. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that you, you first, you have a first or, uh, second order transition of the um, structural transition and then your order parameter grows you know, uh, continuously. And then when the anti Fehrman order set in, um, below 1.6% uh, in, in cobalt doping, then, then you have a sudden jump of, your, of the uh, structural distortion, which is coming from the first order nature of the anti Fehrman transition. And then this first order transition eventually uh, becomes second order after it passes, uh, I think it's a uh, tricritical point around, around here. So, mm -hmm. no, I, I haven't really, no, in, in this uh, analysis, we, we really didn't, um, putting the uh, anti ferromagnetic instability into the system. So I, I, yeah, I'm not sure how that uh, first order transition will, will affect this analysis. And then, mm -hmm. and then there's also uh, the, some, some issue or controversy of what, you know, what, what is the T-star determined by different techniques. You know, there are T-star determined by the, usually what we, at least you know, in the past experiment, what, what was found out is that the, the, the T-star, this, um, uh, extracted from the shear modulus or from Raman seems to be uh, much lower compared to the elasticity. So um, hopefully in the second part of my talk, what, what I'm going to show you is that um, we, we not only measure this, this uh, strain resistivity behavior above the phase transition, now with this uh, elastic XRD, we're also measuring a strain resistivity behavior be below the transition where everything is spontaneously, you know. Uh -huh. and, then, and, then, and, then, and then with the with, with that, then we can actually do some quantitative comparison between mm -hmm. uh, this uh, ratio below and above the phase transition, and then they match. And then, so, so I think, you know, this degree of uh, agreement, it's kind of saying that, uh, first of all, the resistivity is actually a really good uh, uh, representation of the loop parameter. And also this mean field actually work uh, extremely well um, for one reason or another, that, uh, I, I know I understand. Sure, I mean, if you so have the information on two sides, that, that's, that's beautiful, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, so, so for, for phosphor doped stuff, I mean, because the, the structural and magnetic phase transition are completely coupled, right, at all doping levels. So, right. so really, the, this in principle, you can have a second order phase transition, right, it has to be a first order. That's right. Yeah, I yeah, you're 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 absolutely right. The um yeah, I I, I totally forgot about phosphorus though. Uh yeah, uh but okay. So I I cannot comment on uh, how that will impact on the analysis. But what can what can I uh, what I can say is that uh, we have also measured the lesser risk coefficient of the phosphorus though over the whole uh, doping range, mm -hmm. and then at this um uh, in this part of the phase diagram. And uh, this, it looks just like the cobalt dope. Like you, you can, the, the, dope, the, the, the temperature dependence of the acid residual coefficient also like a curve vice like, and then the T star is also 10 or 20 Kelvin just below the, the, the uh, combined uh, first order structural magnetic transitions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so at least no, in the lighter doping, you know, everything seems to work uh, very well, but uh, it's, it's quite strange. Um, it becomes quite strange uh, around optimal doping, where, you know, um, no, it's 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 quite tricky. You know, it's it's kind of related to to all these um, issues and controversy about whether there's a meta pneumatic transition above phase transition. But uh, uh, I can discuss with you offline and share you some data. Sure. But uh, well, uh, this you. this won't be covered in, in, in this talk. Okay. Right. So so no. At least no. No, there, there's some interesting measurements on the lemmatic which 
in, indicates you know, um, there could be some correlation between the supercon and TC and the pneumatic fluctuation. And then we want to directly test that. So, um, and then in a broader context, if you look at the phase diagram of the, a lot of this uh, high TC or unconventional supercon occur, they all share a rather similar phase diagram where some symmetry breaking phase is suppressed and then supercon activity merged. Now here is the hyperintercalated uh, transition metal dichocogenized. Now this is iron-based superconductor. This is the organics um, um, phase diagram uh, uh, controlled by pressure. And then this is the uh, heavy fermion uh, controlled by pressure. And, and they, 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 you know, if you just step back and then uh, you know, from outside point of view, they all look really similar. Then uh, obviously, you know, if we can all do this experiment of controlling the fluctuations and then, and then see how the TC change, when you applying, um, when you when you're controlling fluctuation, then then then, then that would be great to to test. You know, what's the pairing mechanism in, in in these materials? Now the problem is that if you look at the the symmetry breaking phase in all this material, they are all breaking translation of symmetry. And um, no, a, a simple no. So okay, first of all, a simple idea is that if you can apply a conjugate field, you know, just like applying a field to a ferrite magnet which align the fluctuation uh, moment, then you can suppress the fluctuation and supposedly you should suppress the superconductivity. But the challenge for all these other superconductors is that um, the symmetry breaking also involves translation of symmetry uh, breaking. So therefore you, you need a spatially modulated conjugate field to, to suppress the fluctuation. And unfortunately for the neckties, you, know, you have this, or the iron or the charcogenize, you have this pneumaticity, which, it's a, which, which is a Q equals zero um, symmetry breaking field. So therefore it's, a, it's, it's probably the most easiest one to applying symmetry breaking field and suppress the fluctuation and observe its impact on superconductivity. So I think you know, in, in this sense, then the, uh, the pneumaticity in iron-based superconductor is kind of a, a, a very unique um, um, case that, 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 that can, can allow us to test this idea of competing symmetry breaking phases and, uh, and the fluctuation of symmetry breaking phases for superconductivity. Okay, so, uh, Okay, so I'm going to uh, finish the introduction and I'm going to talk about you know, the actual results of applying strength to this material. So let me briefly comment on the methodology. So we are using uh, this uh, device, which um, nowadays you can also purchase uh, commercially, but we build it ourselves. So this was first pioneered by Cliff Hicks um, in uh, Andy McKenzie's group, and in which they basically utilizing three piezo stack that control the motions of two aluminum plates. And then when you're going crystal across this aluminum plate, then either you're moving the plates away or moving the plates closer together, or you're kind of applying strain up to 1%. So obviously there are many ways to applying strain to the material. And then uh, a lot of uh, experts are in the audience. And then for example, like Peng Chen and uh, Stephen Wilson, they have developed this uh, technique of uh, applying unit actual pressures uh, and then doing neutron uh, scattering experiments in situ. Now, I think the, the advantage of this, this um, uh, method is that you can apply in both uh, tensile strain and, and, and compressive strain. So basically both positive and negative pressure um, in the same time. Uh, and then this will turn out to be useful in de determining the nature of the observations uh, we made. And uh, now obviously you can also apply in positive and compressive strain using the method that I just mentioned a few slides before, the elastic resistivity technique by gluing the crystal on the piezo stack. But just due to the nature of the uh, um, the piezoelectric materials property, you know, the, the strain you can apply is of the order, you know, it's definitely smaller than 0.1%. And at low temperature, it could be even lower. So, the, the, so this, this is a really useful uh, device and, and, and technique to, to study the quantum materials. So let me start with the material that already have a pneumatic phase and already have an anti phase. Uh, 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 a composition uh, around this part of the phase diagram. So on the right is uh, the resistance versus temperature of this material where you can see that as you cool down the resistance first, you see an upturn corresponding to the structural transition anomalies. And then uh, uh, um, uh, like inflection points that corresponding to the anti and transition temperature. And then finally a drop at the TC around 13 Kelvin. So, uh, so now, um, we started to applying strain to these materials, which is, um, and, and then plotting the resistivity versus temperature um, uh, below the 20 Kelvin on the left-hand side. So the, the, the strain state is color-coded 
and uh, the red strand corresponding to um, very tensile strand, and then the blue strand correspond the blue color corresponding to very compressive strand. So what you can see is that first of all, uh, in the yellow and green region, which is the smaller strand range, you don't see a lot of change of TC. You know, the resistance versus temperature they, they drop approximately about the same temperature in 12 Kelvin. However, if you look at the normal state uh, resistivity, then the normal state resistivity change a lot. So the reason for that is because you're already in the pneumatic states and then you naturally form in pneumatic structural domains. So the, the, um, the effect of strain in this range is really just aligning this structural and pneumatic domain. So therefore, you, this large change of resistance is really just aligning domain either you know, along the resistive directions or perpendicular to the resistive direction. So what you see uh, with this large change of resistance is really just the large resilient exergy of the structural pneumatic domains. But once you fully saturate the domain and then fully polarize the domain and then you further applying strength, then you're starting to actually um, distort the lattice and then pushing the resistance versus temperature uh, curve uh, uh, on, uh, towards the left. And um, to, to, to make it more, um, more, um, uh, more obvious, then we plot the resistance in the log scale. Then you can really see that you know, this resistance uh, eventually drop into a noise floor at some temperature, but this temperature is being pushed further and further away to zero temperature uh, for, the, um, uh, for, for the either compressive strain or, or, or tensile strain. And then in fact, at the most compressive or tensile strain, even though the resistance is dropping you know, almost linearly in log scale, but uh, if you extrapolate this linear curve all the way to zero temperature, then it reaches to a finite but small value. So in essence, you know, we're actually achieving a metallic state in zero temperature with the strain states um, where you have measured finite resistance instead of zero resistance. So, you may see, um, so if we tra track, uh, I think there's a question. Yeah, uh, can you see why <clears throat> the transition is also becoming broader? So, so basically this uh, suppression of raw, uh, you know, it, it almost traverses 10 Kelvin or something. So what, why does strain make this? Yeah, so uh, this is actually, this is a great question because uh, this is actually the, the, what I'm going to talk about this slide. So, um, okay, so to answer your question, first of all, let's, you know, let's first uh, you know, define, for example, you know, the zero resistance state as TC and then, and then plot this uh, TC as a function of strain. Then you can see that um, uh, this uh, superconducting phase boundary is actually forming like a, a, a dome shape huh? where the, the, this, the, the peak of the dome is at the center you know, at the zero strength state. And, uh, but once you pass this, you know, initially you have a rather flat uh, response to strength, but once you pass certain strength, then this TC drop very um, significantly uh, as a function of strength. So the measurement, what we're doing now is we're applying a constant strength and then cooling down uh, uh, as a function of temperature. So we're doing a vertical cut of this uh, phase boundary. So, um, and you can already see that if there's some uncertainty in strain here, then you can have a very un large uncertainty in TC, which is probably why we are observing a very, uh, very broad um, transition in this, in the RPS system. Actually, do you actually see um, much of a difference? Uh, you know, you know, you know when, when you put string on, your TN shift as well. And TN, TS, I mean, you, you no longer have a TS, right? So how much, right. TN, how much TN has shifted, you know, between compressive and the tensile string? That's a very good question. Um, I unfortunately didn't make a slide about this, but um, I think the TN, you no, know, within the strain range, TN has been um, shifted to um, uh, probably 10 to 20 Kelvin or even wow, larger. Right there. Yeah, that's quite a lot. Yeah, but there, there's a caveat, which is we determine TN from R versus T in, uh, in, um, no, in, in the strength, in the fixed strength curve. And, and to be honest, I'm not that confident of you know, really Absolutely. determining. Yeah, because this, you know, uh, in zero strength state, this, uh, this peak is really sharp and then really just the anomaly of the resistant DRDT you know, ver, um, versus temperature looks just like the heat capacity. But as you apply more and more strength, then obviously the TS, the anomaly has uh, broadened and smeared out. And then also, the, although we're still absorbing a peak, but um, it's, um, it's, I mean, to me, it's becoming more and more questionable to, to using that peak to identify that as T-neo. So you know, if 
we can, you know, for example, combine with your neutron experiment, um, experiment and that, that, that'll be great to actually very, you know, quantitatively map out the this phase phase diagram. Not just actually, my, my my curious question is whether I mean, it, is the magnitude similar between compressive and tensile strain in terms of shifting in Tn? So the interesting thing is that um, the anomalies actually almost disappear when you're tensile stranded crystals. I see. So the the the, it, it's basically looking like a, almost a, a flat, a flat straight curve as a mm -hmm. function of temperature uh, for for this. So presumably, I mean the, the compressive and tensile, they they should do the same, right? I mean they are they are all right. triggering right. this uh, anisotropic stream. That, so so uh, that, I mean I guess I, I was just curious and whether you can essentially think about the you know you're actually using this uh, pressure as a way of a uh, you know, shifting the phase diagram because your TN has shifted, right? You basically yes. shift the whole phase diagram. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. I think that's 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 how we view this as well. You know, this is basically a third axis in the phase diagram, which I will talk about. That. No, but yeah, <laughs> you're kind of already. Yeah, we we kind of already. Uh, it's sort of related to that. If I just try to get an orientation, if I if one uses the uniform isotropic pressure of similar magnitude, does it uh, change TC by similar amount or negligible amount? Right, so again, I don't have a slide for that, but I, 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 I have a, I actually have a slide from, from another talk on, on this. For a similar mm -hmm. compound, you probably need like five or six GPA in order to achieve the same amount. And the, it's, yeah, it's a bit, yeah, I think it's, yeah, so, so first of all, I mean, no, this is quite larger pressure. And then second, I, I don't think they are exactly the same because the, you know, yeah, obviously they, they belong to different you know, symmetry sure, classes. Sure, the symmetry and, is different, but, but yeah. just empirically, you're saying the effect uh, is quite different with the two kind of pressures. Well, well curiously, the RFCT actually looks quite similar. You know, they, they're mm -hmm. also showing, um, yeah, I, I suspect, I mean, it's it's probably doing somewhat similar things, right? Like in, in, you know, when you pressure, it kind of fit, um, shifting the whole phase diagram towards more underdog, and then therefore you're enhancing the pneumaticity and then the, mm -hmm. the yeah. But yeah, I think the effect is very different for optimal dog, which I'm going to show that um, uh, okay. Thank uh, you. In, a, in, a, in a few minutes. Okay, so, okay, right. So no, there was the question of why the curve is so broad. And then uh, I think you know, part of the answer is that it is, uh, we're cutting vertically on a very steep phase diagram. So now motivated by, by, by these questions and then also you know, just from a, technique or from application point of view, you know, it would be nice if we can sit at the same temperature and then switching the super off, off on and off. So we, we, we did this experiment you know, at each temperature and then sweeping strain. And also in order to make sure that we're not really just suppressing a tiny part of the crystals and, and then creating resistant states or we're actually um, inducing a bulk phase transitions. We're measuring, so, so therefore we do a measure, measurement of the magnetization versus strain at a fixed temperature. So this is uh, using the neutral inductance method to measure the magnetization of crystal on the stream. And um, so at low temperature, uh, which is the green curve here, um, so in zero strain, you see a very large negative response. Now this is coming from the Meissner effect. The supercondition state is screening the magnetic field out of the crystals. And either applying positive strain or negative strain, uh, you can drive the system out of the supercondition state and then the Meissner state goes away. So you see a large, uh, increase of the uh, magnetizations and then, and then eventually, you no, know, this the strain you require to push this uh, out of the supercondition state become lower and lower. And then, of course, once you go to high temperature, then you're in the metallic states. You no longer have the Meissner response. So this um, further confirms that what we are seeing re really is not just a some some weird uh, uh, conducting path on the crystal, but really this is a bulk phase transition of the superconductor. Now, uh, just um, as a side note, we are also doing a resistance versus strain measurements, um, which uh, here, um, you know, you can also see that simultaneously while you're driving the system out of the Meissner states, the resistance also um, increase from uh, the noise floor and all the way to, to um, uh, the, the normal state value. And then you can see that there's a huge modulation of resistance, which no, there's like a four orders magnitude of uh, change of resistance as you applying strain, and uh, and uh, very interestingly, this curve uh, at least you know, reminds me of the kind of curve you observe when when you're 
doing, a, you know, for example, like measuring a field effect transistor, where this is the gate voltage, and then this is the um, uh, trend source current. And then, but here, no, this is opposite, right? So in the transistor, what you're measuring is the conductivity while actually going from zero to finite when you're gating the samples. But here, you have a superconductor where your resistance going from zero to finite as a function of strength. Yet the shape of curve looks you know, uh, quite similar. Um, okay, so with all this data sets, we compile the phase diagram of these underdope samples where this blue uh, boundary is the Meissner state, which is, uh, which is enclosed by this uh, black boundary, which is the zero resistance state. And then outside the zero resistance state, there's actually a region where the um, IV curve is still nonlinear. So we characterize the IV nonlinear exponent, you know, the IV exponent in this color map where uh, you, know, you have an exponent um, that is different from one and then close to this uh, zero resistance state. And then eventually when you apply enough strain or go to higher enough temperature, then you're folded back to the um, uh, metallic states with the uh, linear IV. Okay. so. Uh, this is this is the underdope. Now, obviously, the question is, you no, know, and and in fact, this can all be, you no, know, uh, interpreted in, in terms of, um, you know, competing order where you're just increasing the anti ferromagnetic order, and then, you know, as Pongjin mentioned, you know, increasing T nail and then gapping on more carry density. So, what about the optimal doping? So, for optimal doping, we choose this uh, composition seven percent where there's no long range magnetic and structural order. But still, we're seeing a very large suppression of superconductivity um, with strain. And this is the uh, resistance versus temperature curve. And again, uh, with both uh, tensile strain and compressive strain, the TC goes down very quickly from 25 Kelvin all the way to 5 Kelvin within about 1% of strain. So this uh, very uh, strong suppression was um, uh, um, gradually goes away if you go to further, you know, overdoped uh, samples, for example, like this 10% um, overdope where you know, the TC actually only decreased by a little, you know, from 25 Kelvin to 20 Kelvin, 22 Kelvin. But with the same magnitude of strain, the TC only decreased from 22 um, Kelvin to uh, 19 Kelvin. So much uh, smaller suppression in comparison to optimal dope. And then eventually when you go to the uh, um, uh, very overdoped, uh, well, uh, no, slight, even more overdoped samples, uh, around 11%, and what, what, with a TC around uh, 70 Kelvin, then you don't even see this uh, symmetric suppression for both compressive and uh, tensile strength. What you see is that the TC just linearly change with strength. And this is more like the pressure effect, uh, where you're, you're, when, you, when you're squeezing or, or, or pulling a crystal, it's the A1G symmetry mode are, are controlling a TC. So together with all this uh, doping dependence, we, we fit this um, quadratic um, coefficients for the low strain data, and then use that as a way to, to, to quantify the strain sensitivity, uh, which is this uh, alpha term here, you know, these three data points. And uh, with the, this other three data points are the pneumatic sensibility measured by the two and six x. And then you can see that this strain sensitivity is much more sensitive, has a stronger doping dependence compared to uh, the pneumatic sensibility. And, um, and in fact, this kind of measurement has been uh, discussed in a recent theory work by um, Sam Lederow, Erisberg, and Una Kim. They are considering a different system, but the, the same idea is that uh, if you can use um, strain as a way to, to measure the change of TC and then correlate that with pneumatic sensibility, and then this could be a test, you know, like a, the isotope test um, to the um, to, 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 to test the pairing mechanism of the superconductor. And one thing they pointed out is that uh, because the, the strength, strength sensitivity is, you know, ultimately it will be proportional to the pneumatic sensibility square. So if we do expect a stronger dopey dependence for strength sensitivity compared to pneumatic sensibility. So before I closing this section, let me just give a few um, uh, outlook uh, to, to this. Oh, well, okay, no, there's actually one more slide. So, I also want to put this into a context of um, uh, how the strain sensitivity compared to other superconductors. So we compile the, you know, the strain sensitivity defined by the largest change of TC uh, versus uh, divided by TC and um, uh, achieving by strain, you know, uh, and, then, and then plot it against TC for various superconductors. So you have two parades here, and then you have some traditional superconductor, ting, Niobium-3-ting, uh, and also Niobium-selenides. And then you also have stronger root in here. 
So basically, the cobalt dope theorem wants you to have a strong sensibility that is uh, above uh, all the other superconductors except for stronger ruthenate. Uh, and in the case of stronger ruthenate, it's an increase of 1.4 Kelvin to 3 Kelvin with also approximately amount 0.5% um, of strength. Um, okay, and then finally, you know, this uh, very strong sensitivity uh, allows us to construct this three dimensional phase diagram where the T, uh, the T as, as Peng Chen pointed out, you know, T and increase, and then also we can reach another quantum phase transition by suppressing the superconducting dome all the way to zero and, and, and then achieving a superconducting mental quantum phase transition in a three dimensional material. So, uh, a few you know, outlook. You know, and so, first of all, an obvious question you know, an elephant in the room is uh, what is the role of spin fluctuation? So we always have this anti-ferromagnetic phase in these um, materials, and then spin fluctuation has been considered as the leading candidates for the pairing of this material. And in fact, with the strand, you know, the t nil increase, you know, here I'm citing uh, one of the Peng Chen's paper where you, know, you see the t nil increase um, by pressure, and also from the um, from uh, from Nick Crow's uh, MMR measurements at the function strand, they also see that the um, spin sensibility, uh, the, the spin fluctuation actually increase as a function of stream, you know, both tensile and, and, and compressively. So that basically implies that, at least for the optimal doping, where there's no long range magnetic and structural order, when you're applying strain, you're not only suppressing the magnetic fluctuation, but you're also increasing the spin fluctuation. But still, the superconductivity is still suppressed by, by strain. So does that imply that the magnetic sensibility is playing a more important role or the kind of spin fluctuation already change um, uh, fundamentally as you're applying strain and then therefore no longer helpful for superconductivity. No, we don't know. Yeah, no. So, so basically we found that uh, when you put a string on, the magnetic structure actually changes as well. You right. actually induce a C-axis moment. I mean, yeah, this is the sort of, right, sort of right. Nicole's work, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. So, so, so this, this could be, no, so so this could be so 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 yeah, this could be the reason, right? The, the intensity, not not just the intensity matter, but also you know the, the type of the spin fluctuation really matters for mm -hmm. for 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 super hard pairing. Now, uh, obviously, to answer the question, uh, uh, one can answer that by measuring iron charcoalized where there's no longer magnetic phase around. No, at least no, there's no longer magnetic phase, and then in this system, you know, um, both in um, um, uh, Shibuchi's group and then also my group, we, we have demonstrated that there is a, a very strong pneumatic susceptibility. So they have found out that very strong pneumatic susceptibility in the suborbital iron selenides, we, we found out there is a pneumatic susceptibility divergence near in the iron telluride selenides. So it will be interesting to test if you can also see a suppression of superconductivity. So we have some preliminary measurements and then the effect is definitely not as strong as necktie, but as we see the neckties, a very careful doping dependence is needed to, to actually to, to get the whole pictures. So the third outlook is that um, what is the outlook of the, um, you know, what, what is the nature of this strain tune superconducting uh, transition? I think this is quite a, a quite exciting direction because uh, in the past, we only have one way to continuously kind of turn off the superconductivity for bulk material, that is, you know, which is using magnetic field. And now we have a, a, a new way to continuously um, switch the superconducting out and off. And then very interestingly is that uh, near this uh, superconductor metal quantum phase transition, this very broad transition where we see a linear temperature dependence in the log of resistivity actually have also been seen in the superconductor insulated transitions in two dimensional system. This is a work done by Bob Dines on a granular death film where they have some lead islands and then um, repeatedly uh, deposit some um, um, uh, several several films to 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 provide conduction between and and Josephson company between the uh, left film. So you, the the whole system going from insulator and then gradually eventually becomes superconductor when the when when there's a, enough coverage of the several film around the lead island. And then in between this uh, transition, they also see a resistant log of resistant uh, uh, change linearly as a function of temperature. So perhaps that also implies that we also have some, some strong inhomogeneity of you know, intrinsic electronic homogeneity in the system that just behave like a superconducting islands and that just doesn't couple to each other. So I think that's a very interesting direction to explore. So, okay, so let me, I think I only have uh, probably 15 minutes left. Let me try to cover the last part of the talk, which is, uh, a new technique to, to, to study the new transport coefficients in the broken rotational symmetry phase. So you know, to you know, 
all, all this past result motivate us to, to really further look into the, this process of strength detraining or strength, strengthening the, the, the iron-based superconductor. So working with Phil Ryan, John Wu, and Jian Liu, we have uh, developed this um, uh, sample environment where we mount the uh, razor bill strength cells on the X-ray diffractometers. And um, uh, so a, 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 a typical measurement like this, you now we have a, like a, a match C sample, uh, uh, a match these sample, samples uh, mounted across the two sample plates. And then we are measuring transfer simultaneously. And then using a grazing, in the in, in, uh, grazing, grazing angle, we can actually measure a large portion, you know, basically the, 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 the area of the samples where, uh, where we're, we're performing the, the voltage measurements. So uh, let's say we're measuring an underdose sample and then below the structural phase transition, you form structural domains with um, some domains aligning this way and then domain, uh, some domain aligning the other way. So therefore, in the X-ray diffraction uh, curve, no, as a uh, you, you can actually see that the one X-ray diffraction peak is split into two. This is because you see two lattice constants corresponding to two domains. Now, let's say we are sitting at this fixed temperature and then we started to apply a strain along the match stick direction. Uh, then what you can see is that, you know, as a function of strain, which is the X um, curve. No, this strain is, it's not, no, this is like a micro microscopic strain measuring by the strain gauge, of the whole deformation of the samples. And then you can see that as you increase strain, then the, the, the two diffraction peak gradually become one diffraction peak. The intensity of one peak is suppressed and then the intensity of the other peak increase. Um, now th this is basically aligning domain. And then when, you, when you're further applying the strain, then you can see that the diffraction peak started to move in the um, two theta or you know, D spacing. And then you can see that um, it moves linearly with the strain you apply. So now we're distorting the crystal. So uh, just by looking at this peak already kind of answer some of the questions that we had um, before when we were doing this uh, superconductivity study. For example, we worried that the strain was not very homogeneous. Uh, therefore, the for, for example, that broad transitions and then uh, is corresponding to some part of strain sample is being heavily strained and then the other part of sample is not being strained. But if you just look at the X-ray diffraction peak, you can see that the width of this peak is not sig significantly wider than the, uh, the, the width of the peak in the center in the, in the zero strain state. So therefore, at this, in this region of the samples, uh, the strain is quite homogeneous. So um, with these measurements, we can now go back and then check whether this uh, whole idea of uh, distorting the crystal is actually truly suppressing the superconductor. So we plot the uh, orthorhombic distortion, which is the red curve as, an, as a function of nominal strain. And then you can see that uh, there's a range where we are just between the crystal so the orthorhombicity is unchanged. But then you can further uh, distort the crystals and then you start to see the increased orthorhombicity for both um, compressive or tensile strain. And then only once you pass some critical strain value, you start to see that the resistance, which is the blue curve going from zero to non-zero. So in addition to measuring this uh, superconducting and lattice response, we're now also to do some, the measurements we have done a very long time ago, but now doing that in a more precise fashion, which is detweening the crystal and then measuring the spontaneous resilient isotropy. So this part of the figure you have seen already, but um, now, let's say if we plot the, the intensity uh, ratio of this two, and then we can basically plot the domain population as a function of strain, which going from fully uh, A domain this way and then, or for, fully B domain the other way, actually, sorry, the other way around, fully A domain this way and then fully B domain this way. And then this black curve is the resistant versus uh, strain curve. So you can see that uh, even if we fully between the crystal, it's very hard to tell whether just from resistance alone that we have already between the crystal especially in this part of the region where we, between the crystal but the resistance is basically a, a very smooth curve across this. So it's only with the, with the help of X-ray diffraction, um, we can, we, we'll be able to know that we're only between the crystal but not actually further di um, uh, distorting the, the crystal lattice. So we're interested in measuring the spontaneous receipt and isotropy in the crystal, which means that we want to measure the crystal in a state that is just fully between but not being fully, uh, fully uh, strained uh, with the external stress or external pressure. So we're ca carefully monitoring this uh, twin population where we're just reaching the full, uh, full detweenings and then but without change of lattice constant and then identifying the row A and then row B uh, 
where you know, one corresponding to the resistant at this point and one corresponding to the resistant at this point for each temperature. Now we can plot the row A and then row B as a function of tem temperature uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the stream free uh, single domain state. So you may say that you know, this determining measurement has been done 10 years ago, uh, but uh, there's a big difference. For example, like uh, this uh, measurements done in 10 years ago with the you know, actual pressure, you can see that the resilient and such piece already developed well above the phase transition. And this, of course, is because we're already applying the pressure and the crystal has already been deformed. And therefore you're already seeing a mix of the elastic resistance plus the spontaneous resilient isotropy in this part of the uh, uh, um, um, phase of the, of the system. So, so here now we can actually uh, really, really probing the, the spontaneous resilient isotropy and then plot it as a function of temperature. So we define the resilient isotropy as rho A minus rho B divided by rho A plus rho B. And it turns out that this temperature dependence of resilient isotropy looks just like an order parameter, a mean field order parameter with a square root temperature dependence. And this looks exactly the same as the um, structural order parameter where you have a, a structural distortion also have a mean field like temperature dependence. So this same temperature dependence and the same behavior um, it's actually you know, expected from the uh, mean field derivation if you believe that resilient entropy is a good, good proxy of the pneumatic order parameter. So in this uh, free energy where you have the pneumatic order parameter as the primary order parameter and the strain as the secondary order parameter, what you expect is that this, um, you have, will have a spontaneous strain and a spontaneous order parameter. They will have a ratio. And this ratio is actually the same number that corresponding to the beer pneumatic accessibility at the uh, transition temperature. So remember that I mentioned previously that the beer pneumatic accessibility will not diverge, but will reach to a finite value at the phase transition temperature. It turns out that that number is actually exactly the same number of the ratio of resilient isotropy, or sorry, the ratio of the uh, order pr primary order parameter, and the pneumatic order parameter to the uh, structural distortion. So, Therefore, if the resilient isotropy is truly a good representation of the uh, pneumatic order parameter, and then this whole framework of free energy works, then we will expect that the ratio of these two quantity will be the same as the elastic resilient coefficient at the transition temperature. So therefore, measure the elastic resilient coefficient of the same temp uh, of the crystal from um, same batch, you know, and uh, and then uh, the answer is that they, they do match. You know, this, the, the ratio of this quantity is around um, 150. And then if you look at the lesser resistivity, you know, it basically also reaches about the same values um, at the transition temperature. So that, that really means that the resilient isotropy is really, you, know, you can really consider it just like a pneumatic order parameter. And then also that, that the mean field free energy works. So with this correspondence, this allows us to to kind of go to over more doping without actually measuring the spontaneous resilient isotropy and a spontaneous lattice distortion. If we now know that the, the finite value that you reach with the elastic resistivity coefficient is actually just this, um, just, just this value, spontaneous elastic resistivity coefficient, which we define as spontaneous elastic resistivity coefficient. Now, what is the significance of, our, of this quantity? If you think about this, you know, for every Q equals zero broken symmetry states, there's always some new transport coefficient emerge. In the case of ferromagnets, it's the spontaneous hole resistivity. For example, like in this uh, ferromagnetic material, you can see that the um, magnetization versus field just look like the rho xy versus field. Now we also have another Q equals zero symmetry breaking phase, the pneumaticity, where you have the transport coefficient looks just like the, the uh, thermodynamic over parameter. And we know that the anomalous hole coefficient, which is defined by this transport coefficient divided by thermodynamic order parameter, which is magnetization, give you a lot of information about our system, such as Berger curvature. For similarly, we believe that for the resilient anisotropy and the spontaneous lattice distortion, the ratio of these two will also give you similar amount of uh, information, which is telling you the actual lattice coupling. So now using this, um, well, this is basically what I just said, and using this uh, correspondence I mentioned before, we now look at re-examining these uh, elastic receiver measurements before, and then you can see that the value of elastic receiver coefficient at the transition temperature actually increased quite a lot as you reach into quantum critical point. So that basically means that the spontaneous elastic receiver coefficient is also increasing by the same amount 
if the mean field uh, framework works uh, until uh, you're reaching the quantum critical point. So looking back to this uh, color map, now I think there's actually more information hidden within this map. So you can see that this um, lesser degree coefficient is really strong around ultron doping, but this is not just saying that the um, pneumatic sensibility is stronger uh, at the um, optimal doping. It's also saying that the lateral lattice coupling is enhanced. So if you're considering the pneumatic sensibility, you will diverge as you're approaching the critical temperature. So obviously you will, I mean, naively you will expect that you will see the same intensity going from this underdope side all the way to the overdose side. But still you're seeing the intensity increase um, as you're moving toward this phase boundary. So I think that basically means that there's a combination of in, um, a divergent sensibility, but also a divergent electron lattice coupling. So finally, I just want to say that um, in addition to the cobalt of bearing one to two, you know, there's also pneumatic sensibility measurements uh, for other systems, for example, Y111, and then also the iron charcogenides. And then intriguingly, I think all the systems that behave very similarly, that is, you can see that the m 2 m 66 not just diverge as a function of temperature, but if you trace along this phase boundary, they are also seeing enhancements while they go towards the quantum critical point. So this behavior could be a very generic phenomenon of a um, pneumatic quantum critical system. Okay, so I'll, I'll just leave my um, uh, summary slides here, and then uh, I think this is the end of my talk, and then I'll open for questions. We will clap for on behalf of everybody. Thank you all very much for such a fantastic talk. Uh, yeah. Any questions? I know we asked. I asked a lot of questions. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I'm I'm curious on the uh, on, on your assessment of the iron selenide. I mean, you argue that uh, you know there's a string you know can can tune TC. So have you tried iron selenide? What happens uh, there? It's much cleaner, right? Yes, there is much cleaner. There's no um, magnetic phase. We haven't tried that, but uh, I know Cliff Hicks have already tried that, and then. Um, the rumor is that it's not changing a lot. And uh, also, it's, you can also kind of infer that from um, Anna Bomer's measurements where they, they, they measure the ortho, how the orthombicity change when, when you're entering TC. So for cobalt or bearing one to two, the orthombicity decrease a lot when you enter in superconducting states. But for iron selenide, the orthombicity change almost doesn't change when you go across the TC. So that, that already kind of implies that um, there, there, there won't be a lot of suppression because this is, this is basically a thermodynamic relationship that, that works uh, um, both ways, right? right, right. Uh, but yeah, again, that's just pure iron selenide. I don't know what will happen here. And I don't think anyone has, at least you know, to my knowledge, no one has actually measured here. And also mm -hmm. the other side, which is by tellurian doping. We have measured, we have measured a tellurian doping that is, I think can be considered as the overdoped. So we have measured somewhere here. So here the iron selenide is somewhere here, right? And then you iron selenide corresponding to x equal to one here. And then the pneumatic phase is being suppressed along this direction. So there's, this is basically the overdope of the pneumatic quantum critical point. And we also didn't see a very strong uh, suppression. I mean, there, there is suppression. You, you, you can clearly see this symmetric uh, change of the TC. But it's definitely not as strong as the optimal dope or the underdope of cobalt of one to two. So, but, so I would argue, yeah. I would argue that that I mean both well to to the idea that instead of the pneumatic phase competing with superconductivity, it's the antiferment ordered phase, static or antiferment ordered phase, because everything that when you see in the underdope regime, the, the reduction in, in lattice parameter below TC is actually is accompanied by the reduction in the static ordered moment below TC as well. Right. So so I, so it's it's really a coupled it's it's a coupled transition. So just the, the matter fate itself, you know, may, may or may not suggest that, you know, it's directly competing with superconductivity. I, I think this is a very likely situation, but also, I, you know, I want to say that we also see that in optimal dope where we don't really see any evidence of a, of a, um, you know, the onset of a static antiferromagnetic magnetism right, right, as a function right, of strain, right. but still the TC is still quite, so yeah, I, I don't know. My, my personal feeling is that, this is this is probably you know the kind of question that that, that very uh, that depends on you know which part of phase diagram and then specific mechanism and then mm -hmm. so it's not like a clear cut answer that oh spin fluctuation is the is the uh, prime prime uh, prime uh, period mechanism or pneumatic fluctuation is prime American. I think um, no it, it could be very complicated interplay and then but at least now I think this 
this is a way to very quantitatively and then very uh, uh, carefully address this question. Mm -hmm. can, can I just quickly jump in on this one? So in terms of spin fluctuation, I guess, don't, do we know how, how, the, how much spin fluctuations there is in the iron selenium ones compared to the optimal doping of these uh, one to two? Oh, no, no, I, I'm not talking about spin, I'm, I'm talking about a static magnetic order. Because, because in all the, dope, the other samples that uh, Jehua looked at, I mean, there's always a static magnetic order. Static magnetic order moment always decreases. You know, when, uh, well, always enhancing when superconductivity occurs. So it's a direct competing with superconductivity. Whereas in the overdoped sample, there's very little static and long-range magnetic order. In the case of iron selenide, it, it, there's no static order at all, right? But spin fluctuations are there. Right, so it's, it's a, so the strain, so, so you mean the strain in those cases don't, so don't uh, enhance the spin fluctuations? In iron spin, no, spin actually enhances. I mean, we actually have shown that when you put pressure on, your, your anisotropy, nomadic anisotropy actually changes, spin fluctuation actually changes, shifting more from the uh, O1 side to one O side. So, right. so there's a direct coupling, yeah. But then you don't see any effect on TC. Uh, or... TC, TC also changes, I mean, it's, there's always, it's always coupled, right? I mean, but TC changes are, you know, the amount of string we can apply is rather small. TC changes are, you know, yeah, small amount. Uh, I think Pavel, you have a hand up. Um, I have a question about the, the normal state. So did you study something like non fermi liquid signatures uh, and how do they depend on strain? Uh, so which non fermi liquid signature are you? Well, well I, mean, I mean, let's say the resistivity versus temperature or whether mm -hmm. it exhibits some non-T squared dependence, right? And, right? and how these power laws near the quantum critical point are affected by strain. Yeah, yeah, this is a very good question. And um, yes, we, we have some studies, but uh, we don't have any conclusive, um, any conclusive um, results yet. But uh, one difficulty, let me say, say this, one difficulty is that um, once you're applying strain, then now you, you receive it's basically an, isot an, an, an isotropic, right? And um, I guess now, how do you define the power law in this sense? I mean, most of the time, people considering the power law of resistance, um, you know, considering the overdose case where things are isotropic. But uh, here we actually have a, an isotropic resistivity tensor. Of course, you can divide the average of the resistivity as the, as the, um, you know, as the resistivity to compare. You know. um, mm -hmm. But uh, again, uh, once you applying strain, you're already inducing some uh, static magnetic order. So therefore, um, it's it's yeah it's not I mean it's not clear that to me that you can actually make a direct comparison to the the, the kind of non fermi liquid uh, theory people did before. For example, like when you apply a strain, you already see an onset of the. What you see is that the the resistivity will actually have an upturn, even for the average resistivity, will have an upturn going from linear to to showing an upturn as you're approaching the superconducting phase. Upturn, so it becomes upturns. more resistive on on low on cooling or on cooling. Yes, on cooling. And, yeah. and it is just the effect of, no, it can be the effect of the main. So what do you attribute it? To? It's not the effect of the main. I think it's the effect that the system is more resistive in the pneumatic states. So I've, uh -huh. yeah, this is uh, the part that I haven't really talked about, but um, um, for example, like uh, this elastic resistance curve I show you, right? So I show you how rho xx minus rho yy is respond linearly as a function mm -hmm. of an isotropic strain. But uh, in the same measurement, we also show that the rho xx plus rho yy actually responds quadratically as a function of strain. And the quadratic coefficient is positive. So that means that when you're making a system more anisotropic, simultaneously, the isotropic average resistivity also increase. Now, I don't, I mean, I don't have a full answer for this, but my, my interpretation is that this is a evidence that the pneumaticity is deeply related to spin fluctuation. Because when you either increase or, uh, um, uh, or, or decrease strength, then you're, you're enhancing pneumaticity and increasing spin fluctuation, which increases the scattering and therefore increase resistivity. Thank you. You're welcome. Maybe we'll just have allowed two more questions. <laughs> so, many. so Doug, I think you had your hands up first. Yeah, thanks. Um, very, very pretty talk. Uh, quick question. So when you were comparing 
to that old work from Dines, the, this, you know, your sort of anomalous metallic state. Um, you may have already said it and I may have missed it. I mean, so do you think that there is basically still, do you think that there's still pairing going on there? There just isn't sort of global superconductivity? Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, okay. so let me, let me say, I, no, I'm an experimentalist, right? I can only, okay. I can only tell you operationally, you know, how, you know, in the past, people have defined the anomalous mental phase, right? There's, there's a big drop of resistance, which, you know, orders of magnitude drop of resistance compared to the true metallic state. Okay. Right. Okay. There is also... And what, what's the magnetic susceptibility doing there? Is there still a lot of diamagnetism? There is not a lot of diamagnetism. Um, well, we, but although we're measuring the mutual we're using the mutual inductance. So this is not a very you know, super accurate measurements like the squid. Sure. So yeah, I cannot say, I mean, I, I, no, but you can also notice that this, this they, they recover, but that doesn't really fully recover to, to the full right. normal state value. So I think a more quantitative precise measurement is um, needed for to address that. And then that's the direction we're working on. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And then Han Yu. Oh, yes, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, I have a very, very naive question. Um, so for the pneumatic order, um, can I just understand it as the electronic state coupled with, uh, say, omega equals to zero phonon mode, like the, the B2G mode that you're talking about? Um, is that same or what's the difference? So, right, so obviously the, you know, uh, a deformation of the electronic system will couple to the omega zero uh, B2G phonon modes, you know, which, which is basically an isotropic stream. Now, the question is that um, if, let's say if you really turn off this coupling or somehow you can, you can have a fictitious system where you, you fix the strand to be zero so that the, the, the system doesn't move, does the electronic system still spontaneously trying to form in an isotropic stream? And I think if, if this, you know, if in this case, it, still does want to do that, then I will consider it as an electron in antiphase. And the iron-based superconductor is one of them, where you, know, you can measure this by, you can, you can show this by, by doing this uh, elastic resistive measurement, where you, uh, you measure the response of the electronic and the such which is receiving such a P at a fixed stream, and they're still showing a divergent behavior. So that's how I would, uh, how I would define, uh, define electron nematicity. The microscopic mechanism could be very different from one system to the other. For example, you could be have coming from local ferroquadruple orders, or it could be coming from the spin fluctuations, for example, like in the iron-based superconductor fluctuation, then fluctuating density wave. But uh, I think the spirit is that uh, there, there is a true instability in the electronic part of the free energy. Because in this case, even if we fix a strain, so just say clamp the sample, uh, there is no way to stop the structural uh, fluctuation, right? Um, so it, it still somehow coupled with the electronic and isotropy. Is there a way to control that parameter? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's how the elastic system do, right? So you, you're right that if you fix the system, you there could still be you know, structural fluctuation. But let's say if you strain the crystal, right? you're you're basically suppressing a structural fluctuation by forcing the, the structural to be strained <laughs> in a certain way. And then while you're doing this, you can ask a question: Does the electronic still becoming more and more an isotropy? As you're approaching, uh, uh, as you're lowering the temperature, and if it does, then that, that means that the electronic really has an instability to go towards that phase transition. Uh, so this is, yeah. I see, I see. Because in your case, you kind of demonstrate that by applying strain, the TC goes down, right? But the pneumatic order doesn't go down. The pneumatic order, when you're applying strain, then obviously you already break a system. The pneumatic uh, the, 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 pneumatic, oh. the pneumatic transition become a crossover, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's no way to use it. Yeah, yeah. All right, thanks. You're welcome. Any last burning questions before we let you have a rest? <laughs> if not, let's thank Juhal really very much for this very beautiful talk. Thanks, everyone.